Hello there, physics students. So we've gotten the kinematics out of the way, not to say that we're done with it because it will return. We will be using it again, but now we're finally prepared to move on to talk about forces and to introduce the short list of foundational ideas or the short list of principles that carry us through really the rest of the semester. And those ideas are typically called Newton's laws. And whether you realize it or not, you're already familiar with with Newton's second law in particular. So I like to use this example of being at the grocery store, pushing an empty cart. <clears throat> she looks really excited to be shopping at the grocery store. I would be too with this, these well-stocked shelves. And suppose that you apply a given push to the shopping cart, right? We all inhabit a physical body. We know what it means to push on something or pull on something. And so we have some idea about what force is. We know that pushing harder means more force. So I will represent the strength of the force with the length of this vector here. A shorter vector would mean a weaker force, not pushing as hard. Let me get my laser pointer. Now, if you were to push on this cart and maintain that push, let's say it's a shopping cart, it's brand new, uh, the, uh, the bearings are really well lubricated, so there's hardly any friction. It's not like some of those um, older, really messed up carts that you occasionally have the misfortune of grabbing where it's difficult to get them to roll or turn. Really easy to push. If you actually continue to push on that cart with the same force, you might expect it to get faster and faster. Now, there's a limit to how fast it can get because in order to continue pushing on the cart, you have to be running with the cart. And that's not gonna last very long, especially if you're in heels. But for those first couple seconds, you should be able to cause that cart to get faster and faster by pushing on it. So I've plotted the speed of the cart versus time. These numbers are totally unrealistic. You can't actually push a cart at five meters per second down a grocery store aisle because that would require you to run at over 10 miles an hour. I guess that is possible, but most of, it, most of us are not gonna do that, especially in a crowded grocery store. Uh, but I've indicated that the speed is increasing at a constant rate. You can see how the slope is constant. What does the slope of speed versus time tell you? That, of course, is the acceleration. So I'm postulating here and hoping that it seems reasonable to you that uh, a constant applied force would produce a constant acceleration. And that's really a rare situation in everyday life. It's very rare that you provide a constant force to something for any length of time and observe the acceleration. Think about when you're in a car, when you hit the gas, you really only accelerate for a brief amount of time and then that acceleration levels off and goes to zero, um, especially if you're changing gears. When you begin walking, there's a brief acceleration until you get up to your walking speed and then you maintain that speed. Even when you start to sprint, it doesn't take long to get up to your top speed and then you just maintain that for a brief period. So it's not, it's very uncommon in everyday life to maintain acceleration because before long, I mean, think what would happen to this graph. If it keeps going up at the same rate, then it's not long before your speed is real high. Okay, what would be different if instead of an empty cart, you, you plopped in a 24 pack of your favorite soda? Those are fairly heavy. You can feel the weight. We all know what it, what it feels like to have a shopping cart that's starting to fill up. And when you go to push that thing, you know, let's say you're standing, standing in place, browsing items, and then you're done with that section of the aisle, you wanna move on. Now that it's loaded up with stuff, you can feel how much more massive the cart is. Um, supposing you don't want to push any harder than before, if you just push with the same force, as I've indicated with an arrow of the same length as before, you would expect the cart not to pick up speed at the same rate. So same applied push, but this time more stuff in the cart. In other words, more mass, because we know that stuff is made out of atoms, Atoms are massive, unlike particles of light, let's say. So if you push on that cart, it's still going to pick up speed, but not at the same rate. And that's why I've drawn a second line here with a smaller slope. So the rate of increase of the speed is lower. In other words, the acceleration is lower. There's still an acceleration. This cart should still pick up speed if you continue to push on it, just not at the same rate. And if you look at the previous slide, you see how the original acceleration vector was longer than the one on this slide. Let's continue this line of reasoning. This cart would be even more massive if you plopped in another 24 pack of Dr. Pepper. 
Again, you can still get the cart to speed up, but it's going to pick up speed at a lower rate. It's going to be more difficult to get it moving. It's going to accelerate at a lower rate. So I've drawn speed increasing with time still, but at a lower rate. So there's obviously some relationship here. For a fixed force, notice in each slide the length of the applied force is the same. There's obviously a relationship between how much stuff is in the cart, in other words, the mass of the cart and its contents, and the rate at which you pick up speed. And we all know this, everybody knows this. Um, you can probably think of a number of examples from everyday life. Uh, it doesn't have to be pushing something in a straight line, it could even be shaking something. Shaking something back and forth. Uh, something that's, it's like, um, I don't know, what if you had to shake up a one gallon uh, jug of juice, you know, to, to mix the pulp in with the, the rest of the liquid. It's more difficult to shake that one gallon jug of juice than it is uh, a small canister of same same juice. Okay, we might as well do one more here. What if you had four 24 packs of Dr. Pepper? That's definitely going to be a massive cart. You'll feel the weight when you push on it. So if you still push with the same force, you can expect, sure, it will pick up speed, but very gradually now. And as with uh, the previous cases, again, you can't continue this acceleration because eventually you would have the cart moving so fast you wouldn't be able to keep up with it. But uh, getting this cart moving as fast as, as fast as possible sounds dangerous. Okay, so the relationship that we're looking at here is really an inverse relationship. Let me go back a few slides. Notice that as the amount of stuff in the cart, I almost said car, the cart, as the amount of stuff goes up, as the mass increases, the acceleration vector gets shorter. So this is one quantity increasing and the other quantity consequently decreasing. That's not a direct relationship, that's an inverse relationship. So think of this horizontal axis as mass. As the mass increases, the acceleration, which is the vertical coordinate here, decreases. That characteristic scoopy shape, inverted scoopy shape, that's an inverse relationship. One quantity goes up, the other one goes down. Now, there's any number of inverse relationships. There's, there's a whole bunch of functions that you could write down for which the variable goes up and the function goes down, but we're talking about a, a specific function. And it's, it's not obvious that the first guess is the correct one, but I actually lifted this graph from some YouTube channel where they had done uh, an experiment, a little basic physics experiment where they applied a constant force and looked at how the acceleration depended on the mass. And it's not perfect, this is experimental data, so the curve that they fit to the data is not quite the, the curve that we would hope for theoretically. But let's say the, uh, the mass you're talking about is one kilogram. Hang on a second, I've got the toolbar in the way, I can't even see, yes, we are in kilograms down here. So this, whatever the applied force is, this one kilogram mass is picking up speed at almost Three. Let's just round that and call it three meters per second per second. Think of that like um, the shopping cart with one 24 pack in it. Now, obviously, that's a lot more than one kilogram, but just to keep things simple, pretend that um, this blue line here represents uh, like that one 24 pack of soda. What would happen if you were to double the total mass in the cart? So maybe maybe the because the cart has its own mass right maybe the uh four boxes with the cart is like double the mass of just one box of 24 with the cart in any case if you double the mass what's your first guess about how the acceleration would change if, if you can get this cart to pick up speed at three meters per second per second by pushing with a given force when it's when it's uh got one box in it then when you load it up and it's now twice as massive as it was with one box, obviously it's going to accelerate less. How much less? If it's twice the mass, what do you think? Two thirds the acceleration, 90%, 10%. I think your first guess would be half, right? Twice the mass perhaps would mean one over two or half the acceleration. And with this experimental data, we see that that's loosely obeyed because uh, this data point has a y-coordinate close to one and a half, which is one half of three. Again, this is just...
uh, I don't even know if this is made up data or actual data, but at least this curve is, is uh, doing something very close to what we might expect. So what I've written here is that twice the mass would imply one half of the acceleration. That seems like the most logical guess. We know that mass going up means acceleration goes down. What we can't be sure of is whether double the mass really does mean one half of the acceleration. Because think about this. What if twice the mass meant, um, let's see here, uh, four ninths of the acceleration? Four ninths. That's, or even like 48%. That's close to 50%. Would you even notice anything weird if it, if it was 48%? Like that? It's like when you're pushing a cart around a, um, a grocery store, you're not making precise measurements with um, force sensors and uh, digital clocks and really precise uh, measuring tools, you know, like distance measuring tools. So that's like, like a laser uh, tape measure. Is that a thing? Anyway, my point is we have no way of knowing just by using our, our five senses that we were born with, whether this is the actual law or relationship between mass and acceleration. But it does seem like a logical one. How would you confirm that this is the actual uh, way things work? You would need to do an experiment, and that would be easier to do if we were in a classroom. Okay, so what we're really saying here is that the acceleration should be inversely proportional to the mass, or in other words, acceleration is proportional to the reciprocal of mass, one over mass to the first power. And let's take a look at a little simulation here. So unfortunately, this simulation does not come with a digital readout of the acceleration, which is disappointing because it would be nice to be quantitative here. But we've got this ridiculous, uh, he looks like one of those robots from the Clone Wars. You know that movie that won all those Oscars? Oh wait, no, that didn't happen. And we've got various weights that we can stack. See, we can stack boxes on top of each other or put a refrigerator on top. I'm just gonna go with one crate for now. Let's see how much weight we're talking about. Um, please display the mass, and let's put a speedometer up. At least we have a speedometer. So uh, as we make this clone, this robot here, push on the box, we expect it to speed up because an applied force tends to cause an acceleration. And I forgot almost to get rid of the friction. We don't want to deal with friction yet. Friction gets discussed quite a bit in Chapter 6, but we're not there yet. Okay, so let me just... Hit play here. Nothing's happening. Oh, I see. We're at one newton. That's practically nothing. So let me go up by 50 newtons at a time. See the speed up here? What do you notice about the speed? Well, the obvious fact is it's increasing. But what about the rate of increase? Doesn't the motion of that needle appear to be uniform? So the speed is increasing at a constant rate. What do you call the rate of increase of speed? That, of course, is acceleration. Where's the button here? Okay, so I'm going to try that again, and afterwards I will change the mass, and we'll we'll look at the resulting change in acceleration. So, no friction. Please show me the speedometer, and I'll just go up to let's go up to 100 newtons this time. So we'll push on this 50 kilogram crate with a force of 100 newtons and watch the resulting increase in the speed. Okay, there it goes. So pay attention to the rate at which that needle is moving clockwise. It would be nice if we could actually look at how long it takes to get to a certain speed and figure out what the acceleration is, but we don't seem to have that option. Wait a minute. Aha! We do have that option, great. Okay, so they're telling us the acceleration. It's one meter per second per second. Okay, so if we push with the same force, 50 Newtons, and notice we're not worried about the fact that, uh, I mean, 36 meters per second, that's like 80 or 70 miles per hour. That's more than 70 miles per hour. And this guy's barely running, so never mind about that that you have to uh, get faster and faster to keep pushing on the thing that you're accelerating. What would we expect to happen to the acceleration if we double the mass? So still no friction, 
We're still going to a push with uh, 50 newtons, but this time I'll put a second crate on top of the first one to bring the total mass from 50 kilograms up to 100. Well, if doubling the mass cuts the acceleration in half for a given force, we would expect the acceleration to go down to 0 0.5. Let's see if that actually happens. So reset, show me uh, acceleration, speedometer. Here's twice the mass now, but I'm still going to push with 50 newtons. Let's watch what happens. Nothing's happening. Oh, I gotta get rid of the friction. There we go. And sure enough, acceleration is one half. Well, this is not a real experiment, right? This is a Java simulation that somebody programmed. So maybe they just programmed it so that the acceleration does relate to the mass in that inverse fashion. Does that mean it really works that way? Well, of course it does. We wouldn't really be talking about it. Hopefully this is 10% um, as good as doing a thing in real life. Let's look at this a different way now. Previously, I imagined that no matter how much uh, stuff was in the cart, the woman was pushing on the cart with the same force. So the force was constant. It's the mass that was varied, and we looked at the resulting change in acceleration. Now suppose we've got a car in neutral, so it's relatively easy to push. Now, obviously in real life, there's quite a bit of friction between the tires and the road, so we'll have to ignore that. Pretend that this car rolls really easily, and this time we're going to change the amount of applied force. So here's one person pushing on this car to get it to move, and it's the mass that's not going to change because the car has a given mass and we're just dealing with that same car each time. This guy's useless back here, so let's get rid of him. And we can call the applied force F. And now let's plop in a second person. Before I do that, look at the length of the arrow here. That's supposed to indicate the magnitude of the push. And because of that applied force, the car is going to start to roll. Now again, before long, it's gonna be rolling at a speed at which she can't keep up, especially in heels so the car will get away from her. But suppose she keeps running with the car. As long as she's pushing on it, it'll keep going faster. In this idealized world, you may be thinking, again, there's air drag, there's friction. At some point, you're just pushing to overcome the friction and the air drag, and that's true. So try to imagine you've eliminated those. If, if you're not having to work against anything, then as long as you push, the car will keep getting faster. It won't just keep moving, it will actually get faster. That's not real intuitive to us because we encounter friction in almost every situation in our regular life. Okay, if we get a second person in there who's really getting into it, and I've indicated that by making the force vector longer. So let's just suppose we're looking at like twice the applied force. Obviously, you would expect the car to pick up speed at a greater rate. So I've indicated that with a larger slope. So greater force for a given mass, remember we have not changed the mass of the thing we're pushing, a greater force would imply a greater acceleration. Now let's throw somebody else in there, and this joke is so like 2003 here, but um, let's say Chuck Norris is just leaning against the back of the car here. Chuck Norris leaning on a car should be equivalent to like two more people pushing on it with all their might. So let's call it equivalent to something like four people pushing. So I've indicated that with a much larger force vector or longer force vector, and you would expect the car to pick up speed at a significantly greater rate. So there is some sort of direct relationship between applied force and acceleration. For a given mass, in this case, the mass of the car, the harder the push, the faster it speeds up. That's it, everybody knows that, but we're trying to express that mathematically. We're trying to find a way to write that down in an equation so that we can use it to make calculations. That's the big leap. Now, theoretically, this line should go through the origin because if you're pushing with zero force, you get zero acceleration. Uh, again, I ripped this graph off of somebody who had tried to fit a line to actual experimental data. But suppose this first data point uh, represents an applied force of one Newton, and we haven't really defined the Newton yet, so don't worry about that. You've applied one unit of force, you get a given acceleration. That's the height here, the height of that point. If you were to push 
twice as hard, wouldn't you expect twice the acceleration? That's the most logical guess. Now, what's definitely true is that the harder you push, the faster it speeds up. That's undeniable. Everybody's going to agree on that, that pushing harder makes it speed up faster if there's no friction or air drag. But does doubling the force really mean exactly twice the acceleration? Because what if it was 1.9 times the acceleration? Would you really notice the difference? Again, our five senses aren't precise measuring instruments. I, it's tough to say without doing an experiment whether uh, doubling the force really does double the acceleration. But it certainly seems logical. So that's, we're going to postulate that that's the way it works. And if that's true, you can say that acceleration is proportional to force. Doubling one doubles the other. Tripling one triples the other. When one is zero, the other is zero. That's all that says. If you push with five people, that's five times the force, let's say, you would expect five times the acceleration. It's an, a, a very simple suggestion. Suggestion. So in words, we would say acceleration is proportional to force. And there is a very nice, uh, uh, what is it called, an insert? It's like a big box in your chapter that discusses the meaning of proportionality. And you'll, in a future video, I'll point you to the page number, but it's worth rereading that a couple times. It discusses exactly what proportionality means. So the relationship between acceleration and mass was different. Instead of saying that acceleration is proportional to mass, we say it's inversely proportional. M is in the denominator. If you make the denominator bigger, this quantity gets smaller, and hence so does the acceleration. One goes up, the other goes down. That's an inverse relationship. Wouldn't it be nice if we could make those two statements simultaneously? Right? It would be fewer words. We could write it in one mathematical statement instead of two. It is possible to do that. All you have to do is say that acceleration is proportional to force divided by mass. According to this statement, if you double the force and double the mass, there's no change in acceleration because you would have a two up top and a two downstairs, they would cancel. Pushing twice as hard on something twice as massive would cause it to speed up at the same rate as the other thing you were pushing on. Seems reasonable, right? If you push on something twice as heavy, but you're pushing on it twice as hard, there's not going to be any change in the acceleration. Now, this is not an equation, but we can, we can still do similar operations. If we were to multiply on both sides by the mass of the object, now we see we can cancel the masses. And here's the more familiar way of thinking about that proportionality. The product of mass and acceleration is proportional to force. So that, that's a little less obvious. Uh, if you were to double the force on something, Well, if you don't specify which of these is staying constant, you can't really draw any conclusions about which of these must also double. What this says is the product of these two will be double. Anyway, this is, we're going to use this more often in equation form. So let's just switch sides there and say that force is proportional to the product of mass and acceleration. That's the proportionality symbol. And I'm sure you have the urge to replace that proportionality symbol with an equal sign. That's how you're used to hearing it, right? F equals MA, not F is proportional to MA. So how do we get from the statement of proportionality to this equality here? Well, let's test this. Let's, let's pick some numbers that we might be familiar with and see if we can get this equation to work. So if you would imagine that there's a rock floating really far out in space, far away from planet Earth's gravitational field, far from the sun. So let's not worry about the pull of gravity in any direction. This thing's not gonna fall down or sideways. There's no atmosphere. And for some reason, there's just a, a hand out there in space. I looked for an ethnically ambiguous hand. I couldn't find one. So here's, here's this person pushing on the rock. Let's call it one kilogram of mass. Let's just say it's got a mass of one kilogram, which as you will recall, is the mass of one liter of water. Doesn't it seem fairly obvious that if you're out in space and there's no friction, no air, and no gravity, this thing's gonna pick up speed? If you just gave it a push and then let go, you would expect it to just keep going in a straight line. I talked about the air hockey phenomenon that we're all familiar with. If you just um, 
gave this thing a push and then retracted your hand, you would expect it to keep on going. There's no reason it should stop because it's not like when you kick a rock across the ground and it stops immediately because of friction or you skip a rock across the surface of a pond, again, it stops because of, it slows down because of friction and then it just uh, dives down into the water. So suppose you were pushing on this rock with just the right amount of force. And what is force? We haven't really defined it yet, but we know it has something to do with pushing, pulling. Suppose you push just hard enough to get this one kilogram rock to pick up speed at a rate of one meter per second per second. So every second that passes, it's speeding up by one meter per second. See that here? One second has passed and the speed has gone from zero to one. The slope here is one. We know that the slope of speed versus time or velocity versus time is acceleration. Well, my question to you is, how hard do you think you would have to push to get that to happen? You have no direct experience with this really. I mean, we know that um, the more massive something is, the harder you have to push on it to get it to pick up speed. But quantitatively, we don't have much sense of what these accelerations are. I mean, we know that G, gravity, is uh, almost 10 meters per second per second. This is a modest one, and this thing's not that heavy. A water bottle? Take a guess how, how hard you would have to push on that rock to get it to pick up speed at that rate. And when I say how hard, well, typically here in the States, we like to measure force in pounds. So how many pounds are we talking about? Because I'm sure you've all lifted a 10 pound dumbbell. You know what it picks up, or you know what it means to pick up a few pounds of fruit or to do a push up, which is like 50 to 100 pounds on each hand. So what are we talking about? I'm just gonna give you the answer. The force required is that many pounds, less than one pound, in fact, less than a quarter of a pound. It's a little more than one-fifth of a pound. So just a fraction of a pound is enough to get that kilogram to pick up speed at one meter per second per second. So since we've got a mass, that's M, we've got an acceleration, that's A, and a force, that's F, let's take all these numbers, these three numbers, plug them into the equation and see if the equation makes sense. Okay, so if F, the force, is this many pounds, mass is one, acceleration is one, then if we try to force F equals MA, we wind up with this equation. 0.22 equals one, because one times one is one, right? And that does not make any sense. That's not an identity. 0.2248 is not one. So what's wrong here? Does that mean F equals MA is bogus? Because you've heard that equation a number of times before entering this class, I assume. What's going on here? Well, maybe it makes more sense if we actually include the units. This many pounds of force is not one kilogram of mass times one meter per second per second. We could fix the equation. though. We could make this equation work if we inserted a uh, constant of proportionality, as it's called. A lot of times in algebra, they'll say things like, y equals k times x to indicate direct proportionality, k times x, where k is the constant of proportionality. Well, here we're saying that not y is proportional to x, but force is simultaneously proportional to mass and acceleration, and that constant of proportionality out front is 0.2248. Now, where does that constant come from? How would one determine that constant? Well, don't overthink it you would just have to do an experiment. This experiment is not possible. You can't go out in space really and do this yourself, but uh, it's just an experimental fact that this is the number of pounds required to get that one kilogram to pick up speed at one meter per second per second. No more, no less. So you, you could determine this number experimentally, but all you're really doing is figuring out how these various units um, relate. I mean, where does the kilogram come from? Somebody hundreds of years ago figured it would be a good idea to say that one kilogram was the mass of a liter of water, and they already had the liter defined. I don't know where that comes from. And the pound was probably defined in terms of something convenient like a sack of potatoes. And uh, the, the meter, well, you can read about that too. But all of these units have their own histories, and determining what this number is is just a way of connecting all these units that, that have different origins. Okay, so if you would like to measure force in pounds, mass in kilograms, and acceleration in meters per second per second, 
you need this number out front. Let, let's see if it works now. If we plug in the actual force required to get one uh, kilogram to accelerate at one meter per second per second, and actually this is where you would plug in the force, right? That's the left side of the equation, F. Well, this equation is an identity. 0 0.2248 is indeed 0 0.2248. So I have now fixed the equation. If you'd like to see it with the units, there it is. Um, yeah, what I've done here is to show you how that constant of proportionality actually has its own dimensionality. It can't just be a number. It has to have dimensions associated with it to make the equation work out. We know that pounds come out, right? F equals MA, the, the F is force. So if we want the force in pounds, but we're plugging in the mass in kilograms and the acceleration in meters per second squared, then our constant of proportionality has to have these mixed units. Do you see how the kilograms cancel? meters per second squared cancels, and all we're left with is pounds. So evidently, uh, you've been lied to all this time. F is not equal to MA. F is 0.2248 MA, which does not sound as clean. Or is it? I mean, what if you'd like to stick with this equation? It would be a lot simpler, right? Maybe you see where this is going. What you can do is just define a new scale of force, a new unit of force. Instead of dealing with pounds, which are evidently inconvenient for Newton's second law, let's just make up a different unit of force, a different standard. So let's say that the amount of force required to get one kilogram of mass to pick up speed at one meter per second per second, let's just call that one unit of force because one times one, after all, is one. Obviously, we have a name for that. It's called the Newton. Now I've put a lowercase here on purpose. That's like the new, the new convention is to um, leave it lowercase when you're talking about the unit, unless you abbreviate it. If you abbreviate it, you stick with the capital N. So the definition of one Newton of force is the amount of force required to get that liter of water or that rock in the slide to pick up speed at this rate. That's it. It's defined by Newton's, what we call Newton's second law, F equals MA. So you never have to guess what a Newton means or remember a number. It's just one times one in uh, kilograms, meters per second squared. Is this where the name comes from? Or is it this guy? Moving on. <clears throat> Here's another way of seeing that, of, uh, of understanding what I just did with the units there. <clears throat> Again, just a moment ago, I, I pointed out that if you'd like to use F equals MA, but measure force in pounds, and then use SI units on the right side, you need this constant of proportionality, which does have units associated with it. So uh, fixing the equation to make it cleaner uh, is equivalent to, it amounts to setting all of this equal to one. That's what we would like it to be, right? Just the number one. So it says F equals MA. So set this equal to one, as I've done here. And then let's treat the units just like you would uh, a variable in algebra. Let's move the denominator to the other side. And we get this. This is an equality. This says that 0.2248 pounds of force is the same as one kilogram meter per second squared. They're e it's an equality. Basically, it's a conversion factor because what is a kilogram meter per second per second? We just looked at that. That's a Newton. A kilogram meter per second squared is what we call a Newton. So in this slide here, what I'm really saying is one Newton is the same as this many pounds. That's where I got that number earlier. Or may maybe I didn't show that to you. Anyway, you know it now. One Newton is 0.22 pounds, roughly. Is that worth memorizing? Yeah, I think so. You don't have to have it memorized, but it helps. Let's get some practice applying this result to some extremely simple problems here. How about we make the rock two kilograms this time? So that's almost half a pound. And we're pushing on it with 20 Newtons. I'm sorry, I misspoke just now. Um, I said two kilograms was almost half a pound. That's wrong. Uh, 
one kilogram on Earth weighs more than two pounds. It's about 2.2 pounds. And this is a common source of confusion. Uh, a newton of force is about 0.22 pounds of force. That's a conversion from one unit of force to another. But a kilogram of mass, that's not a unit of force, mass is something different. A kilogram of mass on this planet weighs 2.2 pounds of force. It's just a coincidence that, that the, the two twos show up in both conversion factors. So don't let that confuse you as I just did. Okay. Well, F equals MA could also be expressed A equals F over M. Let's very quickly solve for the acceleration. If you push on something with 20 newtons and that something is, has a mass of 2 kilograms, just divide 2 into 20, it's going to pick up speed at that rate. That's about 1G, which is pretty quick, right? So before long, that rock is going to be moving so fast that you can't keep up with it and it would leave your hand and stop accelerating. But I'd like to, to draw your attention to the units here. Newtons per kilogram. So in order to figure out how quickly something will pick up speed when you push or pull on it, it's not enough to know how hard you push. You need to know the number of newtons or pounds divided by the number of kilograms. How much force per kilogram is being applied. It's almost like you're distributing that force throughout all the, the mass units. So it's really about the, the amount of force per unit mass that determines the acceleration. That's a nice way to think about it. So if, if you push on each kilogram of a person's body with one newton, one newton applied to every kilogram of somebody's body, well, that would be one meter per second per second, right? A newton per kilogram is the same as a meter per second per second. That's kind of interesting. How do I know that? Well, because a newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. When you divide out the kilograms, you're left with meters per second squared. So the familiar units of acceleration that we've been talking about for weeks now, the rate at which you pick up speed or, you know, turn if you're talking about centripetal motion or a centripetal uh, uh, acceleration, meaning circular motion, uh, the units of acceleration are the same as distributed force, newtons per kilogram. Hmm. Okay, what if you add a second force into the equation here, quite literally into the equation. This person's pushing backwards. I think most of you have some intuition here. Um, if they were pushing with equal forces, you would expect no motion of the rock, except for maybe turning, depending on where they were pushing. But if they both pushed with the same amount of force, you would not expect the rock to accelerate left or right. In this case, uh, the person on the left is pushing harder to the right, so overall there should be some net force to the right you would still expect this rock to begin picking up speed to the right. So all you have to do is subtract the 6 from the 20. And I've indicated down here, I don't know if you can see it, I think it's out of the, uh, the frame. Let's think of uh, to the right as positive. So the positive direction is off to the right. That means the, the 20 newtons gets a plus sign, the 6 newtons gets a minus sign. That's a net force of 14 newtons divided among two kilograms, you would expect only seven meters per second per second. Okay, so it's, it's not so much about any one force, you have to look at the total force. Look at all the forces acting on this rock to the right or the left, and then add and subtract as appropriate. And what I'm suggesting here is that those two forces, one hand pushing with 20 to the right, the other hand pushing to the left with six, those have the same effect on the rock as just a single force applied to the right of 14. And that's an important concept that you'll be using throughout the semester, that multiple forces acting simultaneously have the same effect as just a single force, which we call the net force or the total force. So there's some of the forces. You can call whatever you want. What's this? Why do I have a blank slide here? Okay. Yeah, this is here to emphasize that point. Typically, it's just written this way, F equals MA. But you always want to remember that this F means something very precise. It's really the sum of all the forces acting on your particle. So this Greek letter sigma, that's the capital letter sigma. It means add up all the various forces. This is one way of writing it. 
Often you'll see in books F subscript net, F net. It means the same thing. The net force is the sum of the forces, where you've accounted for the fact that some are positive and some are negative. That's if you're looking at forces along one axis. Decide which direction you want to call positive. Any forces that point in that direction get a plus sign and a minus sign for the forces in the opposite direction. Sometimes people will be a little more formal and say sum over I of F sub I. This just means like if there's six different forces, imagine six different hands pushing on that rock, sum over all six of those forces. It's just a more, uh, I was going to say elegant, but it's, it's just a, a more formal way of saying this. It means the same thing. And typically, I'm just going to write this. I'm relying on you to remember that F means the net force. It always means net force. Okay, let's rotate the picture here. There's no reason why the, the previous discussion needs to be limited only to applied forces in the horizontal direction. What if we're pushing down and up on this rock? So one person's pushing down with 20 newtons. This time the rock is 3 kilograms. Somebody's pushing up with 5. What would you expect the resulting acceleration to be? We know it's going to accelerate because the forces don't balance. If they were both 20 but in opposite directions, you would not expect the center of mass of the rock to accelerate. Maybe it would flip over because of where they're pushing, but there's no reason it should, uh, that the center of mass should accelerate. However, in this case, the downward push is definitely stronger. We expect uh, the influence of that downward force to be greater than the influence of this upward force. Well, now we can actually be quantitative. We can plug our numbers into an equation. If I'm going to call up the positive y direction, then this applied force of 20 newtons really gets a minus sign in the negative direction. So overall we've got negative 15 newtons. The combined effect of these two forces is the same as a single force of 15 newtons directed downwards. When you divide those three kilograms into 15 newtons, you get 15 newtons, or excuse me, five newtons per kilogram. Five newtons per kilogram is the same as five meters per second per second. You just plug numbers in. So I've indicated the acceleration with our typical red vector there. I notice I did put it pointing down because of the minus sign. So we've now established that it's reasonable to apply F equals MA along the x-axis. So if you sum up all the forces along the x-axis, in my example that would be all the, the hand pushes to the left or right. You set those equal to mass times acceleration along the x-axis. So this is that's important to note that there's a subscript X on both sides. The forces along the X axis are what determine the acceleration along that axis. You don't put Y forces in the equation determining X acceleration. You never do that. You always apply this equa equation along a single axis at a time. And I'm emphasizing that it's the sum of all the forces. So Newton's second law can be applied along the X axis. It can simultaneously be applied along the y-axis, and I don't need a subscript x next to the mass because that has nothing to do with directionality. Mass is mass. Now, why am I spreading things out here? It must be in anticipation of something. Aha. If we do what we've done with the two-dimensional kinematics and place parentheses around these columns of corresponding quantities, this becomes very suggestive. This, to me, looks like a vector written in column form, where this is the x component of the vector, this is the y component of the vector. Same thing here. Which vector would this be? What vector has an x component of a sub x and a y component of a sub y? Obviously, that's the acceleration vector. And over here, we must have the total force vector. Now, I've left off the corresponding equation along the z-axis, but you could easily write that. Most of the problems we deal with are in two dimensions anyway. So a compact way of writing these two equations simultaneously would be... There it is. Do you like the artwork here? I tried to give this, this venerated law the appropriate level of respect. I really ought to have some uh, firework sounds and trumpets. <laughs>
This is what we call Newton's second law. Isaac Newton himself didn't run around calling it his second law because that would be kind of pretentious, but just about everybody calls it that these days. Maybe you're wondering why we went right to the second law instead of talking about the first. Well, we'll get to that in the next presentation. But the first law is really the one I, I uh, alluded to with the air hockey example. You know, the fact that once you get the, the puck moving, it just keeps on going. You don't have to keep pushing on it to, keep, uh, to continue its motion. And we'll see that the first law is, in a way, included in the second law. That, that's a topic of contention among people who write mechanics books. Okay. Should you memorize this? Well, there's nothing to memorize if you understand what it means. It shouldn't take any work to memorize that. Don't forget that this F really is the sum of all the forces acting on your particle. You have to add them all up. There it is. Okay, that's enough of that. Let's do a final example here to close out the video. And this is really more appropriate for the next chapter, but we've got all the tools we need to, to go ahead and solve a problem like this. So we, we're entering a, a, a phase of the class that requires a little more maturity in your problem solving skills. We've spent the last four weeks just building up a vocabulary that allows us to, to tackle these problems. So we have a block that weighs six newtons and it's being dragged up a ramp. We're told the inclination of the ramp. We're told how hard the string is being pulled. That's the same as the tension in the string. And there's a little bit of friction between the block and the surface. And we're supposed to figure out how quickly is this block going to pick up speed or maybe uh, slow down on its way up to the ramp or on its way up the ramp. So the first thing we can do is draw a picture. I've indicated the angle so far and that's pretty much it. Here's the string that's being used to drag this block up the ramp. You don't always have to make a sketch. It's not always necessary. Maybe the next step would be to, to identify the various forces that you can think of and loosely draw them on the picture. We will be doing something called a free body diagram that, that is a rather precise thing to draw, but this is not a free body diagram. So it doesn't matter so much, so much where you put the tails of your force vectors. Here are the, the forces I could think of. There's really a fourth, but we don't need it quite yet, so I left it off. So like I said, it's not real important where you put the tails of these vectors at this point in time. When you do a free body diagram, that will be important. But since the friction force actually exists between the two surfaces, I drew it down here. And I, I could have put the tail here or here. That's not really important. For gravity, I tend to put the tail of the vector at the object's center of mass. Um, throughout this presentation, I've been talking about the forces on a particle. This block is not a single particle. It's not one atom. It's not even a dozen atoms. But for the purposes of finding its acceleration, we can treat it as a particle. Now, later in the semester, we're going to talk about how something might rotate in addition to translating. So this thing is going to translate up the ramp, but very often things are translating in addition to rotating. We'll save that for later in the semester. Okay, I've, I've gone with the letter T for the tension. So in this context, that does not mean period of orbit. It's T for tension. And I plugged in the assigned numbers. Now, why am I calling this F sub G? They told us that the block weighs six newtons. What is weight? Well, Again, that kind of depends on which book you're reading. But loosely speaking, weight is how hard Earth pulls on you through this, this mysterious thing we call gravity. It's the gravitational pull. So F sub G is gravitational force. And I think your book actually uses a capital G F for F gravitational. Okay, so I've, I've indicated the magnitudes of all these forces and their directions. So the tension is along the string Gravity is straight down. And how do I know that the friction points down the ramp and not up the ramp? Well, wouldn't it be weird if you were dragging something up a ramp and it started to feel lighter because the friction was actually helping you out? That never happens. The friction's always going to uh, oppose, especially if you're sliding two things, it's always going to oppose the motion, make it more difficult. 
and it, it's pretty standard to use this script F for friction. Almost every time you see that script F in this class, it will stand for friction. What do we do from here? One of the first things you should do is choose your coordinate system. Since I'm looking at acceleration up the ramp, it really makes sense to put one of my axes parallel to the ramp. Instead of going with the usual Y is vertical, X is horizontal, this is a better choice for this problem. You don't have to do it that way, but now I know where my origin is, and I know that up the ramp is the positive X axis. Now that I have a coordinate system, I can resolve one or more of these vectors into components. Remember that, you have to choose your axes before you start resolving any vectors into components. Okay, well you've seen this a number of times now. The gravity vector, the acceleration vector, can be resolved into components parallel to the ramp and perpendicular to the ramp, as I've done here. Let me get this toolbar out of the way, you can't see it. And I'm interested in this component because I'd like to know the acceleration along the ramp. I will be applying F equals MA in the direction parallel to the ramp, and that means that I need to know all the forces that are in that direction. Any force that's directed up the ramp or down the ramp is going to show up in my equation. Now, gravity doesn't really point parallel to the ramp or perpendicular. It's got components in both directions. That's why I have to resolve it into uh, components and use the component that's actually along the x-axis. This component would be along the y-axis. I don't need that when I apply F equals MA along the x-axis. So that's my next step, is to actually write down F equals MA for the x-axis. Okay, well, I, it looks like I've got one more step in between there. First, let's use some trigonometry to compute the, the length of this component. Notice in the right triangle that I've made and the original six newtons for the weight, that's the, that's the hypotenuse of this right triangle. In order to get the side opposite the 35 degrees, I would use the sine function. So take the hypotenuse, multiply by sine, that will give you the, the side that's opposite the angle. Now I'm ready to plug stuff in to F equals MA. So I'm emphasizing here that this equation is being applied currently along the x-axis. You always apply F equals MA along a single axis at a time. I want to emphasize that repeatedly here at the, in the early stages of the semester. You would never set the y forces equal to mass times x acceleration. Don't mix your x and y, you got to keep them separated. And what does this F sub x mean? It's not just any particular force, it's the sum of all the forces. You have to look at everything that's exerting a force on the block in the x-direction Add all those up with the appropriate plus and minus signs. That's the one number that goes into the left side there. Now I can also solve this for A. So the acceleration is uh, mass divided into the force. And now I'm ready to just plug all the forces in to the numerator. And this is what I find. Because I chose up the ramp to be the positive direction, the tension, which is directed up the ramp, gets a plus sign. So it's positive 12. The friction is opposing the tension. It's down the ramp. Well, down the ramp is the negative x-axis, so that gets a minus sign. And look carefully at the components of gravity. This opposite component does point down the ramp. It also gets a minus sign. And for newtons, I didn't put a kg for kilograms because that's included in this symbol. M is some mass that includes, it's like a number and the units. So what is the mass? Because I actually haven't addressed that. If you look at the statement of the problem, it doesn't tell us how massive this block is. It tells us what the block weighs. And those are two different things, right? If this thing weighs six newtons here on Earth, then you better believe that when you take it to the moon, it's not going to weigh six newtons. In fact, it would weigh more like one newton. So the weight of an object depends on the gravitational field in which it sits. But the amount of stuff it has, if you take this block to the moon, it's still got the same amount of stuff in it. So what is that amount? Can we convert weight into mass? How much mass on Earth weighs six newtons? So let me address that briefly. And very soon we will have a formula for this. Right now I'm just going to give you a conversion factor. But very soon we will have a formula for turning mass into weight, depending on which planet you're
So it's just a fact worth knowing that here on the surface of the Earth, one kilogram weighs about 9.9, .9, excuse me, 9.8 newtons, which is close to 10. And I, I pointed this out a few minutes ago that on Earth, a kilogram weighs about 2.2 pounds. So 2.2 pounds is about 9.8 newtons. If you're going to memorize one of those, I would memorize this one. Okay, so let's convert our newtons, our weight in newtons, into a mass. And I want to emphasize, I'd like to emphasize that you can't really equate mass with force. This is, this is a measure of the amount of matter an object is made of. This is a measure of its weight in a gravitational field, how hard it gets pulled. They're not really the same thing. But as long as we're restricting ourselves to the surface of the Earth, we can go ahead and equate a kilogram with 9.8 newtons. This is how much a kilogram weighs on this planet. So now I can determine that 6 newtons would correspond to this many kilograms. Okay, because in the problem we needed to know the mass of the block, not just its weight here on Earth. So I've used this fact about Earth's gravitational field to determine the mass that corresponds to a weight of 6 newtons. And I'm sure you're noticing, wait, 9.8? I know that number. That's, that's the free fall acceleration. If you drop something, it should pick up speed at a rate of 9.8 meters per second per second. Is that a coincidence that 9.8 also shows up here? Definitely not. Like I said, we'll look at that in a, another presentation coming up soon. Okay, so now that I know the mass, I can substitute that in here. The rest is just calculator stuff. Make sure you, uh, if you're going to do this in a cheap calculator without parentheses, you would evaluate the numerator first, hit, hit equals, and then do the division. And I find uh, a pretty significant acceleration, a little bit more than the free fall acceleration. So there's your first example of using F equals MA quantitatively. Like we, all, we all know that pushing harder on something makes it pick up speed faster. We know that. And we know that Pushing on something that's more massive will cause it to accelerate at a lower rate than pushing on something that's less massive. We all have intuition about this, but by codifying it with this equation that we call Newton's second law and being observant of uh, directionality, we can actually make calculations. And that ends up being extremely useful because um, it's really the foundation of all mechanics, or most mechanics, um, and I'm talking about th that branch of physics called mechanics, but mechanical engineering, um, auto mechanical stuff, it would apply to all of that because if you're designing a mechanical device, then you've got parts that are applying forces on each other. If those parts are moving, you need to be able to predict the rate at which they pick up speed or um, rotate. And so it all comes down to this law. Okay, we can add one more question here, tack something on. What's the perpendicular force between the ramp and block surfaces? So. What's, how hard are the block and the ramp pushing on each other um, in that direction? And we know that there's got to be a force there because forget about the, the ramp. What if your hand was right here supporting this block? Wouldn't you feel uh, some of the weight of that block? So there's got to be a force there. And so this arrow indicates the ramp pushing on the block, not the other way, the other way around. And I probably should have emphasized this earlier, but when you draw what's called a free body diagram, this is not a free body diagram. It's kind of like the, the preliminary to your free body diagram. You're only drawing the forces that act on the object, right? Um, technically, if, if you're pulling on a block with a piece of string, the block is also pulling on the string. And if the, um, if the ramp is pushing up on the block, the block is pushing down on the ramp. That's really the content of Newton's third law which we'll defer discussion of until later. But when you draw this, this sketch, you're only drawing the forces that are applied to the mass in question, in this case, the block. Now, why have I labeled this with an N? Well, another word that's used more often for perpendicular when you're talking about surfaces is normal. So normal has nothing to do with um, your social habits or a growth rate or anything like that. Uh, not that kind of normal. It, it means orthogonal or perpendicular. So we're always going to call it um, the normal force 
And something I didn't really realize until I had been doing this for a while, the, the so-called normal force between the block and the ramp is really just the normal component of the overall interaction between the block and the ramp because there's also this, this uh, frictional component. What is friction? It's a force that exists between the block and the ramp, but that force is uh, parallel. We think of it as being parallel to those two surfaces, but it's still part of that one interaction. The block and the ramp push on each other. That force of interaction has a component parallel and a component normal to the surface. We call the normal component the normal force, which I think is a little misleading. It's really the normal component of the force of, inter of interaction between the two surfaces. And I think it's fairly clear that that force has to point up on the block to prevent gravity from pulling it in. So now we're, we're applying F equals MA along the Y axis. I have to do that if I have any hope of determining what N is. The normal force is along the Y axis. So that's the axis along which I will apply Newton's second law now. Now previously, um, acceleration was the thing we were solving for. We knew all the forces in the X direction. We were looking for the acceleration in the X direction. Now, um, we are looking for one of the forces. The normal force is unknown. If you only have one equation, you can only have one unknown if you hope to solve that equation. So since we don't know the normal force, we had better know the acceleration if we hope to solve this equation. And we do, because we can make an assumption here. If this ramp is made out of something other than, um, you know, water, if it's a rigid object, we expect it to support the block. It, it will not allow the block to accelerate uh, downwards along the negative y-axis. So we can just assume that any acceleration the block has is this way, you know, plus x or minus x, not along the y-axis. In other words, by assumption, the y component of acceleration is zero. So that's often um, something that you, it, it'll be part of your problem-solving process making assumptions about the acceleration that are not explicitly stated in the problem. It's a lot like when something is dropped from rest, you know, in the problem they'll say dropped from rest. It's up to you to identify that means the initial velocity is zero. Okay, what have I done here? I am really just evaluating F equals MA. The left side is F. This is the sum of all the forces along the y-axis. The right side is mass times acceleration. I have written the number zero because I'm assuming that the acceleration is zero. But this really is F equals MA. So I'm saying that if there's no acceleration, then the sum of the forces must also be zero. That's what this says, right? That's what F equals MA says. If one side of the equation is zero, the other side is also zero because it's an equality. I've given the normal force uh, a plus sign because it points up, and my choice of coordinate system says that up is the positive direction. And then where did I get this? Six times cosine of 35. Well, if I look at um, the gravity force vector, the weight of the block, this is the component that's along the y-axis. We've already accounted for this opposite side in the x equation. This is the component that would show up in the y equation, and it does point down. It points along the negative y-axis hence the minus sign. I went with cosine because it's the adjacent side of that triangle. Now, do you see any friction in here or tension? I've only written two forces. The reason we don't need to worry about the tension or the friction is because both of those forces are perpendicular to the y-axis. You see that? This is the y-axis direction. Friction is perpendicular to that direction, as is the tension. So anytime, I've said this before, but any time a force vector is uh, perpendicular to an axis, the force vector has no component along that axis. Or you could say that the component along that axis is zero. All right? The big N is for Newtons. That's the units. Little n is what I'm using for normal force. And I get 4.9. Does that seem like a reasonable result? Well, wouldn't, wouldn't you be surprised to find that the ramp was pushing harder on the block than the block even weighs? We know the block weighs 6 newtons, so it wouldn't make sense for the normal force to come out to be 15 newtons.
why, why would the, the ramp have to push harder than the block even weighs? Unless there was something pushing down on the block, but that's not what's happening in this problem. So the reason the normal force is less than the actual weight of the block is because the ramp is inclined. It's like the ramp doesn't have to support the full weight of the block, only the component of the weight which is perpendicular to the surface. So that's a good representative problem of some of the things you'll be doing in chapter six. We still have to talk about the various categories of force that we encounter, uh, in this semester at least, and we need to talk about inertial frames, which is a rather abstract concept, and then we can dive right into more challenging problem solving in the, the coming chapters.